Welcome to the 2021 P4G Seoul Summit. And thank you for joining the Circular Economy session, a themed Circular Economy Measures Towards a Zero Waste Society. If the conventional economic model was the linear economy in which raw materials are collected and then transformed into mass products that are used and discarded as waste, the circular economy is a model that aims for sustainable growth by minimizing the use of resource inputs and regenerating waste materials as resources. And the circular economy is one of the five key roles um, of the 2021 P4G Seoul Summit and is the 12th goal that the International Society has agreed on to achieve sustainable future by 2030. So our session brings together stakeholders from public and of course uh, private sectors to discuss circular economy measures to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 and shift into a zero waste society. So here at the Dongdaemun Design Plaza, we're joined by delegates, experts who are here as speakers, as well as industry professionals and citizens as audiences, and also representatives from public and private sectors, international organizations, and academia will be joining us online. Moreover, at one section of the venue, various upcycle items are being displayed. And products and items that used to get discarded after use have now been given a new life as beautiful hanbok, which is the Korean traditional dress, and cool fashion accessories, as well as useful daily essentials. I think they will let us see and experience how the discussion today will take its tangible form in our daily lives. And at the end of the session, there will be a very interesting and special performance. All stories and ideas that was presented and discussed during the session are to turn into an amazing work of art. So please stay with us until the very end and to see what kind of work our session would inspire to be created. So ladies and gentlemen, now let's begin the 2021 P4G Seoul Summit's Circular Economy Session. Uh, presentations and discussions will take place in a hybrid format where delegates attend either in person or online and inside an inspiration that every participant brings to the table will contribute to the meaningful outcome of the session. So first of all, please join me in welcoming Environment Minister Han jong e of Republic of Korea. Please welcome him. Hanjong,皮波基,首尔,中山,会,孙安,经济,session,呃,参赛,呃,参赛,呃,参赛,呃,参赛,呃,参赛,呃,参赛,呃,参赛,呃,参赛,呃,参赛,呃,参赛,
지속가능한 경제 모델을 구축해야 합니다. 지금 세계는 기후위기에 대응하기 위해서 순환경제 활성화 노력을 적극 이어가고 있습니다. 지난해 유럽은 경제성장과 자원소비의 탈동조화를 목표로 한 신순환경제 행동계획을 발표한 바 있습니다. 순환경제를 기후변화 대응뿐 아니라 산업의 경쟁력을 높이는 핵심 전략으로 삼았고 산업 전반에 걸쳐서 자원순환성을 높여가고 있는 것이죠. 대한민국도 함께 노력하고 있습니다. 자원순환 사회로의 전환을 위해서 2018년 자원순환에 관한 기본법을 제정하였고 이에 기반한 자원순환 기본계획을 수립하여 추진 중에 있습니다. 지난해 12월 한국 정부는 2050년 탄소중립 이행을 약속하고 이를 위한 10대 핵심 과제 중에 하나로 순환경제 활성화를 제시했습니다. 우리에게는 그동안의 성과도 있었지만 여전히 해결해야 할 숙제가 많습니다. 저는 이 자리에서 순환경제가 대한민국의 경제, 사회 전반에 스며들 수 있도록 몇 가지 약속을 하고자 합니다. 우선 2021년을 순환경제 전환을 위한 원년으로 삼아 이를 위한 법적 기반을 마련하고 한국형 순환경제 실천 전략을 수립하여 추진해 나가겠습니다. 둘째, 그간 버려져서 소각되거나 매립되어 온 폐기물이 원료로 또 자원으로 다시 태어날 수 있도록 순환경제 선도 모델을 발굴, 지원해서 산업 전반으로 순환고리를 이어가도록 하겠습니다. 셋째, 우리의 일상 속에서 누구나가 다 순환경제의 주인공이 될수 있도록 라벨 없는 생수병, 일회용품 없는 커피 전문점 등 불필요한 일회용품과 포장재 사용을 줄이는 생활 속의 실천 기반을 확대해 나가도록 하겠습니다. 마지막으로 전 지구적인 순환경제 노력에 동참하고자 합니다. 대한민국은 유럽연합 등이 주축이 되어서 지난 2월에 출범시킨 순환경제와 자원 효율성을 위한 국제동맹에 가입하여 공정한 순환경제로의 전환을 위한 국제협력에 함께 이바지하도록 하겠습니다. 오늘 피포지 서울 정상회의 순환경제 세션에 국제기구, 정부, 기업, 전문가와 시민이 하나의 목표를 위해서 모였습니다. 지속가능한 자원의 사용으로 폐기물이 없는 사회로 한 걸음 더 나아가기 위한 스마트하고 손에 잡히는 순환경제 전략이 도출되기를 기대해 봅니다. 저는 이 자리에서 다시 한번 대한민국의 순환경제 실천 의지와 지속적인 노력을 약속드립니다. 독주가 아닌 협주로 경쟁이 아닌 협력으로 순환경제 시대의 조율자로서 대한민국이 함께 하겠습니다. 순환경제 모델이 같이 사슬 전반에 뿌리 내릴 수 있도록 함께 힘을 모읍시다. 감사합니다. Thank you, Minister. Your words clearly reflect that Korea's vision and also commitment to the circular economy. Thank you very much. And now it's time to invite our keynote speaker. Denmark is one of the most environmentally friendly countries in the world. And today we're going to meet Minister Leah Vermelin, Denmark's Minister for the Environment. Thank you. Dear ministers, dear excellencies, dear speakers, dear participants from the P4G family and from other countries on our beautiful planet. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about the potentials of a circular economy at this P4G session. And thank you for your commitment to this important agenda. As humans, we have spent centuries refining a certain skill set, that of extracting the resources of our planet. Over time, we have developed new methods, each one more effective than the last. From the aqueducts of ancient times, to the offshore pipelines of today. From using picks and shovels to unearth minerals to now deploying enormous drills and bulldozers. Make no mistake, our ability to harvest metal, food and fuels have helped us thrive. It has lifted millions out of poverty and sparked innovation around the globe. And today's conference, where we meet across continents, wouldn't be possible without copper wire in our laptops or LCD glass in our screens. But while our use of natural resources has indeed become effective, it has yet to become efficient. 
We all share this one planet. But by 2050, we will be consuming as if we had three. And we will be generating around 70% more waste per year than we do today. This cannot go on. We need to ease the pressure on our climate and biodiversity. We need to speed up the transition to a circular economy. And we need to work together to build back a greener world in the wake of the current pandemic. Making a successful transition to a circular economy is in many ways like solving a jigsaw puzzle. Only that the puzzle would never fit at a dinner table as it is the size of our planet. And that the pieces aren't small bits of cardboard, but instead every resource in the global economy. Plastic bottles and paper bags, window frames and kitchen tiles, steel beams and smartphone chargers. It is a puzzle so large, so intricate, that in order to solve it, we need everyone to contribute. Governments, businesses, civil society. Furthermore, we need to solve it quickly. Because right now, too many pieces are discarded or lost forever. Some are buried in landfills or burned in furnaces. Others find their way into oceans or nature, hurting animals and our environment. Here, a multilateral venue as P4G is crucial to piecing together the puzzle by bringing together countries and companies from all around the world, from Asia to the Americas, and from Southern Africa to Northern Europe. I believe we can find the solutions we need. In Denmark, we want to be at the global forefront when it comes to climate action. We want to reduce our impact while creating jobs and reaping the benefits of green technology. Therefore, less than a year ago, we set an ambitious goal to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 70% in 2030. To achieve this, all sectors have to contribute. Transport, industry, construction, agriculture, just to name a few. Here, collaboration between the private and public sector is key. Therefore, we started the process by creating climate partnerships. Partnerships where leading Danish companies and organizations gave us their recommendations on how we can reduce emissions to each sector. Needless to say, many recommendations were linked to a more circular economy. In Denmark, we have been working with circular economy for the past 15 years. And while we are still in the early phases, we have already succeeded in lessening our impact, creating jobs and driving up exports across a number of sectors. One example is our water sector. Many of our wastewater plants are now so effective at turning sewage into biogas that they have in fact become net energy producers. The sector is increasingly contributing to the circular economy, not only by energy and heat production, but also by making sure that nutrients and other resources are recovered. And today, Danish companies are helping states and countries all over the world to achieve a more efficient and sustainable water sector. In other areas, we still have work to do. One of them is our waste sector. In Denmark, we produce more household waste per citizen than any other OECD country. Instead of holding a record in producing waste, we want to lead the way when it comes to preventing the loss of natural resources. Therefore, we have made a new national plan for waste management and prevention with the goal of a climate neutral waste sector in 2030. Right now, we are therefore streamlining the way we sort our waste on a national scale so that no matter where in Denmark you live or go to work, all household waste is sorted in the same way. This will not only make sorting and recycling easier for our citizens, it will also improve the quality of the waste streams making it more attractive for companies to invest in new recycling technologies. We believe a strong focus on circularity will not only benefit the climate and environment, it will also benefit businesses. And why is that? Well, there are numerous reasons. Let me just point out a few here today. First of all, as the threat from climate change grows, so does the will to do something about it. 
just within the last few years, large and small economies alike, has set forth new ambitious climate goals, goals that was unthinkable just five years ago. Meeting these goals is simply not possible without adopting a more circular economy. To achieve net zero, we need to achieve a zero waste society. And already we see new legislation and new strategies aimed at speeding up the transition. For instance, the EU has in record time adopted measures to tackle single use plastic, meaning that the range of plastic products where sustainable alternatives are easily av available like plastic cups, food containers and wet wipes will be banned this summer. We need to create incentives for companies to design smarter using fewer resources and making sure that their products can be repaired, reused and recycled. Here we look especially forward to the upcoming proposal from the EU Commission on a sustainable product initiative. It should combine minimum requirements on products to access the internal market with incentives to push for still more innovative and green products and also provide reliable and trustworthy information to consumers on green claims. This type of regulation means businesses will have to adopt, but it doesn't mean that it will be bad for business. In the EU, for instance, manufacturing firms spend up to 40, about 40% 40 on materials on average. Here, a more circular economy with closed loops can increase profitability and shield companies from price fluctuations as the ones we see right now, where prices on commodities like copper have reached all-time highs. Last but not least, the circular economy can spark innovation, leading to growth and new jobs. In the EU alone, transitioning to a more circular economy has the potential to create 700,000 new, new jobs. Just imagine how many jobs could be created on a global scale. So to me, there really isn't an alternative and we need to help each other across continents, countries and companies to promote circularity. Here, yeah, this summit will be important, not only to strengthen the green impact of P4G, but also to serve as a stepping stone to COP26 where we need to put special emphasis on the importance of public-private partnerships. Together, I believe we can solve the puzzle of circularity and steer the world into a greener, more sustainable path, benefiting both the climate, biodiversity and businesses. Thank you all for listening. I wish you a fruitful session and an inspiring summit. Thank you, Minister. Denmark's efforts towards circular economy reflected on their policies is very inspiring. Thank you once again. Now well, we will hear from our next keynote speaker. The Basel Convention is an international treaty that was designed to reduce the movement of hazardous waste between nations. The treaty that first came into force in 1992 were amended and came into effect in January 2021 with the objective of enhancing the control of transboundary movements of plastic waste. Let us invite Mr. Rolf Payet, Executive Secretary for the Basel, Rotterdam, and Stockholm Conventions to hear about how these changes will affect the global circular economy system. Distinguished Excellencies, Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to take part in this session of the P4G Summit and contribute to this reflection on a vision for circular economy. The current take make waste extractive industrial model is not only environmentally unsustainable, but it is also a missed economic and social opportunity. We've been surrounded with potential environmental threats that illustrate the challenge for our societies in decoupling economic activity from the consumption of finite resources. World Bank statistics, for example, forecast that the global waste production will grow to 3.4 billion tons by 2050, more than double the population growth over the same period. In 2019, People worldwide discarded most of the estimated 54 million metric tons of electrical and electronic products 
mostly end of life kitchen, laundry, and bathroom equipment, like microwave ovens, washing machines, and dishwashers. This is comparable to the 1.15 million 40 ton 18 wheel trucks, enough to form a line of trucks 23,000 kilometers long. And that's more than the distance between Seoul and the South Pole. Again, these statistics is a sobering reality that less than one sixth of last year's e-waste is thought to have been diverted for proper recycling and reuse. Should this trend continue, the future paints a bleak future. Through a circular economy, we can reduce environmental impacts while achieving large economic benefits. Working electronic goods and components, for example, are worth more than the materials they contain. They should be designed to have an extended lifespan and also be able to be recycled cost effectively and also energy efficiently. Once achieved, the extended lifespan of the product and its parts, e-waste recycling has been proven to be economically viable and attractive, providing economic opportunities such as labor for the circular economy. The collection, segregation, and primary dismantling of non-hazardous fractions of electronic waste can also be organized with relatively cheap, simple, but safe processing methods. The raw material value in electronic waste alone is estimated in 2019 to be worth than $57 billion. That is equivalent to 76 billion South Korean yuan, three times more than the annual output of the world's silver mines and more than the gross domestic product of most countries of the world. There, there is 100 times more gold in a ton of mobile phones than in a ton of gold ore. Furthermore, recycling the resources and re reusing the resources and recovering the resources from used electronics produce substantially less carbon dioxide emissions than mining from the earth's crust. If the sector is supported with the right policy mix and managed in the right way, it has the potential to create millions of decent jobs worldwide without harming human environment and the uh, human health. E-waste is not only a post-consumer problem. Designers, manufacturers, investors, traders, miners, raw material producers, consumers, policymakers, and others have a crucial role to play in reducing waste, retaining value within the system, extending the economic and physical life of an item, as well as its ability to be repaired, recycled, and reused. Taking a systems approach and redesigning the entire electronic device life cycle for a circular economy could also create more value in the system. Although good work has been happening, this sector has the potential to generate socioeconomic and environmental benefits. Many challenges still remain, including major environmental and health impacts resulting from dismantling, material recovery, and final disposal of the, of the electronic product. For instance, cable burning is a major, major source of dioxin emissions especially in poorer countries where no facilities for sound environmental recycling of e-waste is available. Besides current recycling practices, focus on the recovery of steel, gold, aluminum, and copper are quite inefficient when compared to extraction of other metals. The Basel Convention has contributed to increase circularity in the, economics, in the electronic sector by developing technical guidance for environmentally sound management and the transboundary movement of e-waste. The convention has also provided a multi-stakeholder platform for sharing best practices, guidance documents, and policy experience with the follow-up partnership to PACE, which is the Partnership for Action on Computing Equipment. Plastics is yet another example of a major source of pollution and missed economic opportunity. You may already have heard that if we continue following the same trend, there may be more plastic than fish in the oceans by 2050. According to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, 
after a first short use cycle, 95% of plastic package, packaging not material value, or US 80 to 120 billion annually is lost to the economy. The Basel Convention's plastic waste amendments adopted in 2019, which made the Basel Convention the only globally and legally binding instrument that currently and specifically addresses plastic waste, has helped to advance circularity by creating the conditions for the global trade in plastic waste and also to become more transparent and better regulated as well as inciting, inciting governments to provide incentives to strengthen national capacities and infrastructure for the environmentally sound management of plastic waste, and thus encouraging innovation towards the prevention and minimization of plastic waste. Finally, to assist parties in implementing their obligations, the Plastic Waste Partnership under the Basel Convention was also established. Following the waste hierarchy and a life cycle approach, project, project groups of the Plastic Waste Partnership addressed, among others, prevention and minimization, as well as recycling and financing. To facilitate concrete results on the ground, with funding from Germany, Norway, and Switzerland, 23 pilot projects will be implemented, cutting across these themes. Polish pollution has a negative environmental and economic impact. And according to the Lancet Commission on Pollution and Health, pollution is the largest environmental cause of disease and premature death in the world today. Diseases caused by pollution were responsible for an estimated 9 million premature deaths in 2015. This is 16% of all deaths worldwide. Existing knowledge of pollution impacts on the environment and people points to the need to urgently prioritize action to tackle pollution, a planetary crisis which adversely impacts the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. COVID-19 has further illustrated this need, as studies suggest that the impacts of air pollution combined with the impacts of COVID-19 can lead to the worst health and planetary outcomes. Furthermore, the pandemic has also brought along additional challenges such as the exponential growth in the production of medical waste due to the wide use of personal protective equipment, or PE, and the increased use of single-use flat plastics. In general, there has always been a strong culture of single-use disposable medical devices with consequences such as environmental and public health-related issues, supply chain vulnerability, and increased healthcare expenditures. This is backed by a wrong perception that single use is cheap and more healthy, but reuse can be cheaper. Manufacturers have a strong influence on obsolescence to force consumption. Circularity requires cooperation of diverse stakeholders, and it is not a wide, widespread concept as yet. For instance, recycling may be an alternative for low complexity devices such as syringes and needles. Reuse of non-steroid clinical equipment while keeping product integrity is an option for high complexity devices. There's also the option to shift, to shift from products to services, but more studies are needed to assess these other potential opportunities. Policies, regulations, and incentives need to be in place to allow for change and compliance. For example, with the availability of standards to follow protocols and procurement rules, linked to product design as well as safety measures for reuse are important. Innovation is also needed. For example, with the development of more sustainable materials and solutions, we can lead to more robust products and less obsolescence, but also is much easily, easily recyclable products. The achievement of the sustainable management of chemicals and waste is key to a circular economy and is among the objectives of the sustainable development set out in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. SDG 12.4 sets out to achieve by 2030 the environmentally sound management of chemicals and all waste throughout their life cycle in accordance with agreed international framework and significantly reduce their release to air, water, and soil in order to minimize the adverse impacts on human health and the environment. 
the Basel Rotterdam and Stockholm conventions are milestones in the environmentally sound management of chemicals and waste. They share the common objective to protect human health and the environment from the adverse effects of chemicals and waste and provide a framework for the life cycle management of chemicals. Together, they cover the elements of the cradle to grave approach. For example, most of all the persistent organic pollutants covered under the, the Stockholm Convention are also subject to the Basel and Rotterdam Conventions. All wastes, all chemicals listed under the Stockholm and Rotterdam Conventions also fall under the scope of the Basel Convention. Waste prevention, minimization, and the environmentally sound management of hazardous and other wastes are legally binding under the Basel, Rotterdam, and Stockholm Conventions and are key to a vision for a circular economy. Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies and ministers, with these few words, I thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, you're joining at the P4G Seoul Summit Circular Economy Session. So in a while, the speeches and discussions that took place today will be presented to you as a piece of painting at the drawing performance. So please stay with us until the very end and see what kind of picture our session has inspired to create. Thank you. And next, we're going to have another panel discussion on challenges and solutions for the transition towards circular economy. We're ready to deep dive into the topic. Before then, first of all, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this session. So he was voted as the 2008 National Geographic Adventurers of the Year and is one of the youngest Britons to climb Mount Everest. He was the first to travel from the North Pole to South Pole using only human and natural power. He is also an environmental scientist, a professor in the Department of Biological and Environmental Science at Tungguk University. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor James Hooper. Good afternoon. I am deeply honored to be here and be able to be the moderator of this important session this afternoon. Um, as an adventurer come scientist, I am deeply aware of the uh, impact that the economy has on the environment. And so I'm really looking forward to exploring the future of the circular economy uh, that we are going to create together uh, with the panelists that we have with us this afternoon. So this afternoon, we are operating in a hybrid format. We have some panelists which are here with us in Seoul in person, and some that are joining us online. So I'd like to, first of all, introduce the panelists that are here together with us in Seoul. First of all, uh, we have Mr. Na Gyeong Soo, President and CEO of SK Global Chemical. We're also joined by Professor Lee Sung Hee of Gyeonggi University. With us online, we're lucky to be joined by the Vice Minister Roald Lapeer, and he's Vice Minister of Infrastructure and Water Management in the Netherlands. We have Ms. Wanjira Matai, Vice President and Regional Director for Africa at the World Resources Institute. Mr. Stephen Stone, Chief of Resources and Markets at the UN Environmental Programme. And Mr. Evangelos Gidarakos, President of the International Waste Working Group. Thank you very much for joining us here this afternoon. I'm really excited to see how this discussion is going to unfold, but uh, before we proceed any further, uh, I'd like to present a video message from someone who would have liked to have been here today, but unfortunately wasn't able to join us in person. He manages one of the companies uh, that uses the most plastic bottles in the world. However, it's also a company which is searching to find the most innovative solutions to reduce its plastic footprint. So let us hear from Mr. James Quincy, CEO of Coca-Cola. 
Welcome to the P4G Summit. It's an honor to participate in the Circular Economy Session. Collaborative, cross-section solutions are more important than ever. The Coca-Cola Company and our bottlers operate in more than 200 countries and territories, and we're committed to making a difference. Our environmental, social, and governance goals are embedded in how we operate. Water, packaging, and climate are critical priorities. Our 2030 water strategy is focused on water security. This includes where we source agricultural ingredients and touch people's lives. We're putting in place regenerative water use techniques in our operations, such as circular water use programs. We're also increasing access to water and sanitation with a focus on women and girls. We will continue to invest in replenishing water alongside other partners to support watershed health. In 2020, we returned to communities and nature 170% of the water used to manufacture our beverages. We are also working to create a circular economy for packaging through our World Without Waste initiative. This means designing recyclable packaging, using 50% recycled content, and collecting a bottle or can for every one we produce by 2030. To date, over 30 markets are using 100% recycled PET bottles for at least one brand, including three markets using 100% RPET for locally produced brands. We stand ready to support the Korean government as it works to set a standard for food and beverage grade recycled PET for the Korean market. As a company and as a planet, we understand the need to address the global environmental challenges. These include plastic packaging waste and greenhouse gas emissions. The goal is not a plastic-free economy. Instead, it is a circular economy in which materials can be used and reused, thereby addressing both challenges. Since packaging represents about one third of our company's carbon footprint, our world without waste effort is critical to our climate goals. We have set a science-based target to reduce absolute emissions by 25% by 2030. We are developing advanced plant-based packaging that requires less oil. We're lightweighting our bottles and we're investing in local recycling programs to collect old bottles so they can become new ones. These efforts are lowering our carbon footprint one package at a time. Indeed, Plastic packaging with recycled content has a lower carbon footprint compared with other packaging materials. That's why we believe plastic can be part of our future when it functions in a circular economy like PET does. Partnerships are key to solving the global challenges of water scarcity, waste and climate change. Today's discussion will help drive actions that create a better shared future for people everywhere. Thank you. Well, that was definitely exciting to uh, see what such a large company uh, is able to do and what it plans to do, uh, operating in so many different countries and to be able to see that uh, it's looking to use more 100% recycled bottles in its production facilities. Um, and indeed that the recycled plastic bottles are less carbon intensive uh, than the uh, virgin plastic bottles. So certainly exciting uh, things are happening. I guess, as we can see in the video, uh, there is a reality that a lot of plastic uh, is used in the global economy. And since the outbreak, particularly of COVID-19, the world has seen a vast increase uh, in the disposal of plastics and particularly single use plastics. Um, I'd like to ask a question to uh, Ms. Wanjira Matai, uh, the Vice President of the World Resources Institute, if that's okay. Ms. Matai, what is the current situation in terms of waste generation in Africa and particularly in Kenya? Um, and how are you dealing with the issue? Thank you very much. Um, and it's a pleasure to be at this conference. I must acknowledge that waste and the 
uh, waste generation in Africa and in Kenya, certainly I can speak for, that's where I'm from, has always been um, an eyesore. We, everywhere you go, you tend to find uh, what seems like uncontrolled uh, piles of waste. Uh, add to that COVID that has just uh, added the unprecedented amounts of waste given owing to the fact that there's just been very little um, planning that has gone into what we need to do. And, and there's just a surge of waste uh, around the country. But it's not always been that way. You know, I know, I remember a time growing up where we had uh, a recycling culture evolving as a child. And, that, and I'm talking about 40 years ago, there were situations where you, you waited for someone to pick up your glass bottles. You waited for someone to pick up your tin. You waited for someone to pick up newspapers. And there was a sense of this evolving uh, circular economy at the time. But we have a situation where we are um, learning about just the dangers of uncontrolled and unsustainable waste. According to UNEP, actually, at the moment, Africa has only been recycling 4%, around 4% of its waste. And this is just a far cry from the ambitions that we have for up to 50%. Um, and, this, and the waste disposal is particularly challenging in informal settlements, you can imagine, where the delivery, the pathways for recycling are just not there. And a lot of the waste, they say oh, almost half of the waste we generate does not get collected. But there are rays of hope. You know, there is a situation that, um, we, and it is a situation that, we, that requires significant commitment. All parties, the waste producers, the households, commercial locations, everybody will need all hands on deck to ensure that we take control of this situation. And so that the, the, the examples exist and we have heard several of them in the, in the earlier sessions, but we really have to have the sort of commitment and all of society commitment to make it, um, to make it happen. So, I mean, uh, the answer should lie definitely and, and one of the many answers, at least on the continent in rediscovering some of the cultural linkages to circularity because they do exist. And a lot of those will fuel and help us grow um, a real culture in, in recycling. That was fascinating to hear about the history uh, of your experience. And also, uh, I guess, sad to hear that only 4% um, of material is currently recycled and shows that there's a, a huge uh, amount of uh, possibility um, for improvement. Um, and also, I guess, to hear about some of the unique aspects that um, will affect the ability to increase the amount of recycling uh, in Africa in terms of um, informal settlements. So thank you very much uh, for that input. Um, I guess leading on from that, um, that 4% and the need to increase it, uh, many experts claim that being able to increase the amount of recycling that we do and the reuse of waste as a resource would also contribute to the reduction of carbon emissions. And an increasing number of countries, as we know, uh, including Korea, have pledged to become carbon neutral in the coming decades. So last November, UNEP's International Resource Panel released a report which highlighted the importance of improving resource use efficiency to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And so I'd like to ask a question to Mr. Stone. In what ways can a circular economy contribute to achieving carbon neutrality? Thanks very much, uh, James. It's great to be part of your panel and great to be hearing from Wanjari as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's a huge part of our pathway to carbon neutrality. We can't get there without circularity and the circular economy. Just to give you an idea, the amount of throughput of raw materials every year is on the order of 100 billion, uh, 100 billion metric tons of raw materials extracted and processed, which has a cumulative footprint of about half of all carbon emissions, about half of all carbon emissions. 
And the amazing thing, as um, my colleagues were saying, very little of that is actually cycled back into the economy. Some of it, of course, goes into buildings, and that's our infrastructure stock. A lot of it goes straight into the atmosphere in terms of emissions, and other parts go into landfills or into the ocean. So circularity has a huge role to play. And I was also listening to Stefan Zikars closing up the last session from Unido. The value chain approach has a lot to offer because by zooming in on those parts of the economy, that drive material consumption, we can actually reduce it. So buildings and construction, um, food, food systems, huge part of our carbon emissions and our, our material flow, uh, transportation, textiles, plastics. These are areas where we have huge opportunities to reduce our resource use, our resource consumption and reduce our carbon emission. One last thing I would say, um, James, is that, you know, with the green recovery efforts, like those announced by uh, the Republic of Korea, Europe, many other countries, this is a great time to rethink how we invest in the circular economy. $16 trillion worth of announced stimulus spending. We need to make it green. Thanks, back over to you, James. Thank you very much, Stephen. Wow, those are huge numbers, 100 billion metric tons uh, of new material put into the global economy every year and uh, being responsible for 50% of global carbon emissions. That is obviously um, you know, a huge potential gain if we're able to figure out how to implement uh, the circular economy well. It's now been a year since the plan was adopted, and I'm guessing that the initial implementation of the plan must have been more difficult due to COVID-19. However, it would be great to hear from you, Vice Minister Le Pair, what you feel the major accomplishments have been and what kinds of challenges and limitations you faced uh, in the initial application of the plan. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, let me say uh, good afternoon from the Netherlands. Good evening, probably in, uh, in Korea. And I'm honored to, uh, to be joining uh, you at this uh, P4G conference. And uh, the Netherlands is, of course, very happy to be a uh, proud supporter of, uh, of P4G. Uh, regarding your question, I would like, first of all, to reiterate the points made by, by a few speakers already, namely the enormous importance of embracing a circular economy for uh, the, climate, uh, the climate goals we have. Uh, Stephen indicated that 50% of all CO2 emissions are related to material extraction. So that in itself is a very important reason to embrace the circular economy. 90% of biodiversity loss is actually the result of uh, resource extraction. So we have very, very good reasons to embrace the circular economy. And uh, this is uh, even uh, a part of the uh, economic growth and jobs it can provide for. So uh, that is why the Netherlands has, has embraced it uh, wholeheartedly but also the European Union as a whole. And indeed, regarding your question, the European Commission presented its circular economy, economy action plan uh, last year. It actually uh, consists of 35 concrete actions. Uh, you could think of a ban on single-use plastics. Uh, you could think of uh, uh, the um, mandatory use of recycled content in, uh, in plastics. Uh, the... Uh, improved repairability of products, uh, as well as the, uh, the necessity to take out uh, toxic substances or substances of high concern from materials that are used in products to improve recyclability afterwards. So, so uh, I could mention the other 31, but I won't, uh, I won't do that right now. That, those are just four examples of concrete actions that, uh, that are part of that uh, uh, EU a circular economy action plan. And it is, of course, meant to uh, ensure that action is taken, but also to inspire and encourage other parties and participants. And uh, you just mentioned yourself the necessity of all stakeholders to be part of this, not just governments, also indeed uh, private sector, NGOs, academia. So, so also I think this is one of the main goals of the Circular Economy Action Plan of the European Union to ensure that governments uh, lead this, but uh, do it together with other parties. And then in finishing, uh, you were introduced as an adventurer, James, and um, it is indeed, it sounds a very big adventure to travel from the North to the South Pole, completely powered by nature. 
Uh, I would also like to say that the the trajectory to a circular economy is also an adventure. Um, we need to find the way to do this, but we have to do it. Failing is not an option because if we don't do this, we can't become carbon neutral. If we don't do this, biodiversity loss will increase. And that is something we cannot accept. So it's not just a no-brainer, it's a necessity. And let's, uh, let's make this adventure successful together. Vice Minister Lepper, I, I like your analogy there, and, um, and thank you very much for, for a thorough, thorough answer um, of the, um, the strategic plan that the EU is implementing. It would be interesting to, I guess, hear a little bit about how that compares to Korea and the situation here um, in terms of uh, the best practices, the technological developments, and the prospects that exist uh, in the field of waste management here in Korea. Uh, and particularly including waste sorting, collection, uh, and recycling in terms of a shift towards the circular economy here in Korea. Um, Professor Lee, would you be able to uh, share with us uh, the current situation in Korea? Okay, thank you. In order to shift to a circular economy society, the best practice of recycling should be applied to various ways, such as food waste, electrical waste, and the life vehicles, etc. Under the concept of three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. The best practice of sorting and collection and recycling of waste in Korea can be explained by the system of separation and collection. Under the system, six items, waste paper, plastic waste, glass, can, textile, and styrofoam, has been collected separate and recycled more than 70%. Recently, the recycling practice have focused on the packaging and plastic waste during corona pandemic period. In Korea, there is a long history of developing recycling technology in the form of industry, research institute, academia, consortium for more than 30% since 1990. New uh, G7 project and New Frontier project and Global TAR project was carried out to promote the valuable and clean recycling technology on a global scale. Technical development should be sustainable because it may be an evolutionary process, it is not a revolutionary process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lee. Um, I can, I guess, personally attest to myself that the, the system of separation and collection uh, in Korea for recycling is, is very good. Um, and I guess one of the important things here is it's a part of society. It's part of the culture to separate your waste into uh, different uh, I guess, compartments in order for it to be recycled. And so definitely Korea is very strong uh, in that area. Um, it also sounds like there is a particular focus linked with that on recycling specific high volume and high value materials. Um, and perhaps this is obviously a good platform to build on towards achieving a circular economy to start with these high volume, high value materials uh, and expand out to the more difficult to uh, recycle materials following that. So I guess taking that, uh, it would be good to maybe narrow our focus a little bit onto one such material. Plastic pollution has become one of the most pressing environmental issues. And I think it would be great to hear from a company that produces and distributes plastic products, to hear their perspective and their approach to the issue. Luckily, uh, we're joined here by uh, Mr. Na from SK Group, which is a member of the P4G Board of Directors. And it's also the third largest company in Korea. And I've heard that recently uh, it's become the domestic leader in terms of ESG strategy and management. And would you be able to tell us about SK's main initiatives to promote a circular economy throughout the entire life cycle from sourcing to production to consumption and through to disposal 
of these products, or I guess rather than disposal, hopefully recycle. SK Group is a leading company in Korea that is leading the world in the field of ESG and greenwashing. And I am a member of SK Global Chemical. In 1972, SK Group was the first to start the use of plastic as a source of carbon credit. And for a long time, SK Group has been using plastic as a source of carbon credit. But in recent years, it has become the leading cause of carbon credit as a source of carbon credit. 어, 제2의 탄생을 꿈꾸고 있습니다. 지금부터는 어, 저희가 만들었던 플라스틱을 다시 순환으로 시키는 것을 저희는 목표로 하고 있습니다. 그래서 어, 그거에 대한 좀 구체적인 두 가지 방향을 좀 말씀을 드리겠습니다. 오늘 이 자리에서는. 어, 첫째는 어, 계속 앞에서 연사들께서 말씀하신 것처럼 플라스틱의 리사이클 비율이 굉장히 낮습니다. 그래서 저희는 이 플라스틱 리사이클 비율을 획기적으로 증대, 증대시킬 수 있는 기술 개발에 지금 굉장히 큰 역점을 두고 있고요. 어, 두 번째는 우리가 플라스틱 없이 또 살기는 굉장히 어렵습니다. 그래서 이 플라스틱을 사여, 사, 사용하게 된다면 가능하면 친환경적으로 사용할 수 있고 어, 리사이클이 가능하게 디자인하는 것두 가지를 큰 목표로 삼고 있습니다. 어, 세부적인 저희 기업의 목표를 그래서 저희가 생산하는 플라스틱의 100%는 아니면 그 이상을 직간접적으로 리사이클 하도록 어, 하도록 하겠습니다. 저희가 구체적으로 좀 말씀을 드리겠습니다. 그러면 리사이클 비율을 높이기 위해서 지금 저희가 집중하고 있는 부분은 케미칼 리사이클에 특히 집중하고 있습니다. 페페트나 아니면 페폴리에스터, 뭐 페, 페비닐 뭐 이런 다양한 플라스틱 쓰레기를 다시 석유로 돌리는 겁니다. 그래서 다시 그 열분해를 가해서 다시 석유 자원으로 돌려서 다시 플라스틱의 원재료로 쓰는 것에 지금 저희가 기술 개발을 하고 있고 어, 자체적인 기술 개발 및 글로벌 기술 업체와 저희가 조인을 해서 어, 상업화를 지금 추진하고 있습니다. 깨끗한 플라스틱은 다시 사용할 수 있는 메카니컬 리사이클도 저희가 어, 어, 계속 관심을 가지고 있고요. 그러려면 플라스틱이 굉장히 잘 분류되고 수거되어야 됩니다. 그래서 갖고 있는 디지털 역량을 활용을 해서 그런 영향, 영역에서도 저희가 순환 경제에 기여를 하고자 합니다. 친환경 제품이라 하면 기능성이 유지되면서도 적은 양으로 그 기능을 유지한다든가 아니면 리사이클된 레진을 기존의 석유 레진과 섞어서 물성을 만들어낸다든가 아니면 생분해성 수질을 만든다든가 특히 중요한 것은 재활용이 가능하도록 첫, 처음부터 디자인하는 것이 굉장히 중요합니다. 그래서 제가 그런 것을 굉장히 많은 매니팩처러나 브랜드 오너들과 지금 코어업을 하고 있고요. 이걸 통해서 저희는 플라스틱의 유용성은 유지하고 그렇지만 이게 순환 경제에서 플라스틱이 재활용되도록 하는 것을 진정성 있게 지속적으로 추진할 예정입니다. 감사합니다. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Now, for that insight into uh, what uh, SK Global Chemical uh, are doing uh, in the recycling space and what they plan to do. Um, I guess it was interesting to hear about the distinction between chemical and mechanical uh, recycling, um, and I guess how those can be done separately, which I guess is important in terms of achieving the goal of recycling all plastics, uh, which, as you said, SK is setting out to achieve recycling more plastic than it uh, produces. That said, it's also, uh, as you said, plastic is something which is very difficult to not use at all, and there's obviously still a need to continue to use plastic in the economy. And so, I guess, that puts the focus on where can we find those improvements in plastic recycling. Korea currently produces 191 kilograms of plastic waste per capita per year, but the recycling rate could definitely be improved, as Mr. Na pointed out. So I'd like to go back to you again, Professor Lee, to ask what you think are the best ways to achieve a plastic less and a zero waste society in order to transition to a circular economy. Thank you. And we understand that plastic waste was generated a lot in Korea. So we made a master plan of plastic waste management. There are several ways to achieve the plastic less and zero waste society. Among them, I'd like to emphasize two ways, technical development and partnership. 
technical development is necessary to recycle various types of waste and produce alternative materials, such as bioplastic, to replace the plastic materials. That changes the concept from the cradle to grave to cradle to cradle. And in particular, recycling practice, recycling technology should be developed sustainably with a technical roadmap due to the environmental situation and conditions of the countries. Also, partnership is very important in creating zero-waste society. Partnership between stakeholders, partnership between the society in domestic, partnership between the countries around the world should be established, work together towards a circular economy society. So I like to mention that if we work alone, it is just a road. But if you work together, it can be a history. Such partnership can make a history in zero-waste society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lee. I think that's a great point, that the partnerships are very important. I guess the very nature of the circular economy uh, means that it requires all parts and all stakeholders in the economy to work together towards a common goal by, by the nature of it being a circular economy. So thank you very much. I think everyone can agree that the transition to a circular economy is necessary. We've heard that in terms of uh, the carbon emissions that, that it produces, and we can see it in terms of the amount of waste that needs to be dealt with on an annual basis around the world. However, from a business standpoint, there also needs to be, uh, I guess, the issue of profit considered. And so businesses need to find a profitable way to be able to work inside the circular economy. And so I'd like to ask Mr. Na again what his thoughts are on the shift to the circular economy. Can it benefit companies economically and is it possible to generate profit within that system? And if so, what are the prerequisite conditions that make it possible? 네, 기업을 하는 입장에서 이게 서스테인 하려고 하면 단, 반드시 프로핏은 나와야 된다고 생각합니다. 그리고 저희가 어, 그거에 대한 프리컨디션이나 아니면 상황을 한네 가지 정도로 요약을 해서 말씀을 드려보겠습니다. 첫째는 아까 탄소 발자국, 탄소 발자국 얘기를 많이 말씀하셨는데 어, 플라스틱 1톤을 생산하는 데는 약 1.3배, 1.3톤의 CO2가 발생을 합니다. 어, 반면에 이것을 만약에 어, 재활용을 하는 음, 아까 말씀드렸던 케미칼 리사이클을 한다고 하면 탄소 저감 효과가 약 85%라는 어, 발표가 유럽에서 한 연구기관에서 있었습니다. 그걸 좀더 검증을 해봐야겠습니다만 가설적으로 한 100만 톤을 저희가 어, 리사이클로 생산을 한다고 하면 탄소 감축이 약 110만 톤의 탄소 감축 효과가 있는 겁니다. 그래서 현재 탄소 배출권 거래 가격이 뭐좀 어 변동성이 있습니다만 5불 정도로 본다고 하면 약 5천만 불 정도의 100만 톤당 이익 또는 코스트의 절감 효과가 생긴다는 겁니다. 거기서 분명히 이 비즈니스의 향후에 어 코스트 경쟁에 확보하거나 이익을 낼수 있는 기회가 어 된다고 생각하고 있습니다. 두 번째로는 어떤 제품을 만들더라도 코스트 경쟁력 있는 제품을 만들어야 됩니다. 사실은 폐기물을 갖다가 그걸 다시 제대로 된 상품을 만들려고 하려면 굉장히 많은 과정이 걸립니다. 그리고 아까 이 교수님께서도 말씀하셨습니다만 한국에도 이런 소규모의 열분의 업체들은 이미 존재합니다만 아마 굉장히 소규모고 이게 배치식으로 되어 있기 때문에 코스트 경쟁력을 갖고 있지 않습니다. 거기에 저희 같은 케미칼 회사의 대기업들이 어, 기술을 케미칼 기술을 개발을 하고 스케일업 가능한 엔지니어링 기술을 넣고 어, 자본을 투자해서 이걸 연속식으로만 한다고 하면 분명히 코스트 경쟁을 갖출 수 있어서 어, 경제성도 확보할 것으로 보고 있습니다. 세 번째는 어, 그럼에도 불구하고 마켓이 형성이 돼야 됩니다. 소비자 행동이 굉장히 중요하죠. 어, 우리나라 자, 대한민국에서는 최근에 친환경 제품이 굉장히 많은 인기를 어, 끌고 있습니다. 그리고 어, 
소비자 조사에 의하면 65%의 한국 국민들이 플라스틱 저감 제품을 프리미엄을 주고 구매하겠다는 의사를 밝히고 있습니다. 즉 브랜드 오너나 매니팩처러들이 이러한 시장에 맞게 제품을 디자인하고 판매한다면 분명히 마켓은 형성될 거라고 생각합니다. 마지막으로 또 하나 중요한 정부의 역할이 있습니다. 정부는 이 환, 이 환경이 조성자 역할을 해야 됩니다. 이런 기술이라는 것이 어, 제대로 되려고 그러면 좀 시간이 걸리는, 걸리기 때문에 그 기간까지 정부 환경부나 정부에서의 어떤 지원 인센티브라든가 아니면 다양한 규제를 완화한다든가 아니면 더 많이 사용할 수 있는 규제 새로운 정책을 만들어서 이 환경을 조성해 준다고 하면 분명히 에, 프로핏은 생길 거고 그게 곧 서스테인한 경제 활동이 될 것으로 저는 그렇게 생각하고 활동을 하고 있습니다. 감사합니다. So that was fantastic to hear from Mr. Na about the positive economic drivers uh, which can contribute towards realizing the circular economy. Uh, an 85% reduction uh, in terms of carbon emissions through chemical recycling, that's quite astonishing. Uh, but also to hear how such a big company is able to realize uh, effective economies of scale uh, in terms of the reuse of plastics is very encouraging. And finally, uh, to be told that in Korea, and I think this is reflected globally, that 65% of consumers uh, say that they would be willing and keen to purchase products which have been recycled and which have better green credentials. And so I think overall what we can take away from that is that there really is an economic uh, sense and an economic reality to, uh, for companies to work inside a circular economic model. So one of the themes that I think we've heard from, from a number of uh, panelists is the need that even with the correct institutional framework to allow the circular economy to take place, it would be difficult to achieve this without the active participation of a country's citizens or, or global citizens. And so this means that raising awareness and educating the public about the need to transition towards a circular economy and how they can be a part of that is really important. So it'd be great to hear more about what are the best ways to achieve this? How can we best educate uh, the populace to make them want to be involved? And perhaps the best person to speak about this is Mr. Kidarakos. Would you be able to give us some insight into this issue? Well, uh, I'd like, uh, of course, to thank the excellent organizers for this invitation. It's uh, um, a big uh, pleasure for me to be here today with us. Um, I think um, it is very important uh, to support uh, integrated and uh, sustainable um, waste management and promotes, of course, practical and, uh, and scientific development. So, and I mean, some of the main uh, goals are knowledge transfer, dissemination of information, and of course, um, education. and. Um, Regarding the education activities uh, and capacity building in uh, developing countries, for example, um, the activities of uh, the IWWG, regional branches in uh, Latin America, in uh, MENA region, and also in Southern Africa, um, provide important contributions. What I mean is, uh, for example, smaller events are targeting to transport the results of the larger events in Europe. For example, conference in, here in, uh, in Crete or in Sardinia or uh, um, in Bergam. But I'd like to, to give a, a, a clear opinion of, um, on Zero Waste. This is my personal, but also from the International Waste Group. Um, there will be no real Zero waste strategy in waste management. Uh, and this also in circular economy in the next years, in the next future. I think the handling of materials, from raw materials to products and their use, to recycling activities and final deposition, 
always leads to material losses, for example, emissions. So recycling also leads to the accumulation of pollutants and to a reduction um, in the quality of the recycling products. So in this uh, respect, uh, I think there will always be material and substances that have to end up in the landfill. So what is the consequence? I think consequently, the goal cannot be zero waste at the moment, but the sustainable reduction, I mean the avoidance, uh, of waste to an economically and ecologically sensible level. I feel economic and ecology have to be very, very important. For example, in the EU, in the European Union, this has been recognized by the limit of 10% of MSW to be landfilled by 2030. So thank you for the moment. Thank you very much, Mr. Gadalikos. Um, I think, as you said, uh, in terms of getting people on board, um, sometimes to approach people with realistic goals can help to make people think that they're really able to contribute to creating that change. And it's also, as you said, being able to share stories from different parts of the world to uh, share that knowledge, to transfer that experience uh, can be very powerful. Thank you very much. So I think as we have been speaking, we can see that uh, all the elements uh, all the different stakeholders that uh, make up the circular economy, uh, it's important for them to work in partnership. And it's important to be able to bring them together. Uh, and by bringing them together, um, that's how we'll be able to realize uh, these goals and to be able to work together towards change. But in terms of bringing together various stakeholders, the role of researched institutions uh, like the sorry, like the World Resources Institute and other NGOs is particularly important, I think. And so it would be good to go back to you, Ms. Matai, and to listen to your thoughts on this. Thank you. Uh, um, the World Resources Institute, as you've mentioned, is uh, a research organization, and we work uh, at the intersection, we say, of environment and development, um, turning what we call big ideas into action. And, the truth of the matter is circularity is really an, a great example of this intersection. Uh, there are a number of platforms at WRI that are concerned or at least uh, focused on this in particular. We have, of course, P, the P4G Hub, which we host proudly engaging with partnerships around food waste reduction, clean energy investment and efficiency, and then also sustainable transportation. But we also have you know, the platform for accelerating the circular economy, PACE, which is uh, one of those that we are also discussing today. The truth of the matter is um, we see these platforms and all platforms like them uh, focused on reframing our assumption about growth, uh, about sustainability, and you know, our own view of our place in the world. I really like what uh, Mr. Girakos has said, because it is true that there will be waste and there will be, um, our ambition is really to ensure that we drive towards uh, sustainability. Now, we see P4G as a place where we can see speedy, swift, scalable market-based solutions that can be developed and grown. And that's exactly what we need, is a global architecture that understands how to grapple with these issues, particularly in developing countries where we really must build resilience, a more efficient use of resources because efficiency is a very big part of this. And then of course, the sustainable business models. There's a wonderful emerging paradigm around nature-based solutions that is, a, is, is wonderful because it embraces this concept of what we must change around us and around this planet, around the issue of, of uh, decarbonization and certainly addressing the climate crisis. We have to produce uh, our food and, and uh, what is important for our livelihoods. We have to do that more efficiently. So our production itself needs efficiency across the board. We have to protect what we have. 
safeguarding what we have to ensure that we continue to push down um, the emissions, but also to reduce the burden on other systems that would, uh, would need efficiency built into them. But even more relevant to this particular discussion is this issue of reducing waste, whether it's across the food systems, uh, value chains, or greenhouse from product use and manufacturing. I was amazed to hear from the Coca-Cola CEO, a third of their emissions is in their packaging alone. So production and manufacturing, as well as food production, has really got to be where we address, and we heard 50% uh, of global gas greenhouse emissions come from, from there. And then I think the important one is to restore. So this has to be an entire all of systems approach uh, so that the pressure is not only on, on the reduction. So that's a little bit about what we do. We've heard about P4G and also about PACE, but those are two platforms that WRI is really proud to host that are part of the work we do. Thank you very much, Ms. Matai. I thought that was a, an excellent summary of, of what we've spoken about so far and, and to tie together the idea of having a global architecture, a global cooperation, but also the need to find the local market-based solutions which allow this to operate sustainably. And, and finally, as you mentioned, to find inspiration in nature for alternative ways of, of achieving these goals. So thank you very much. That was a, a wonderful sum summary. Saved me a job. <laughs> now we've looked at this fundamental concept uh, of the circular economy, and we've discussed ways that we can promote it and share it uh, with the public. So moving on from that, um, I think it would be good to ask um, another question to uh, Vice Minister Laper. So as we uh, promote the participation from different stakeholders, so including the government, uh, including the private sector, civil society, and so on, um, we need to be able to accelerate the transition to the circular economy and we need to do this at the international level. So it'd be interesting to hear from you, Vice Minister, how the Netherlands pursues a multi-stakeholder approach, bringing these different players together to be able to achieve these goals. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll, I'll be happy to, uh, to go uh, uh, into, uh, into that. And uh, let me here build upon what uh, Mrs. Matai has already said on the platform for the acceleration of the circular economy, which is uh, hosted by WRI, by the World Resources Institute. This is, uh, I think, a prime example of a platform that brings together governments, private sector and other stakeholders to indeed do exactly what you were just referring to, namely ensuring that we translate our goals into action. And uh, the... Uh, the action plan of the platform for the acceleration of the circular economy does contain concrete actions on uh, electronics, on plastics, on textiles. Let's not forget textiles. Uh, uh, they emit more CO2 than um, air, airlines and, uh, and the maritime sector together. So that are, I think, examples of uh, clear platforms that are meant to really achieve uh, practical results. Um, and then, in addition to that, I think the, the point that uh, Mr. Guidarakos referred to, that it is very important to include knowledge and to include the academic community to ensure that uh, we also include uh, innovations that are being developed. I think this is something that is important. Let me give a very practical example of this. A lot of metals that are in use at present are contaminated by cadmium, by chrome-6, by zinc. And until very recently, we were actually not able to really recycle that metal that contained um, contaminated metal in a proper way. And through a very close cooperation with ac academics and research, we have now opened the first factory in the Netherlands that can indeed completely recycle those products without uh, maintaining the toxic element of it. It's being taken out. And this, I think, is a prime example of uh, setting a goal because we want all metals to be recyclable. But if they're contaminated, you need 
uh, the the highest level of knowledge to be able to ensure that you can do that in a safe way, and that's what we have to achieve in several of those chains. And I'm uh, I'm proud that we can work together uh, with that because that is often bigger than one country or one university. You really need coalitions to do that. Thank you very much, Vice Minister Le Pair. That was a, a fantastic example to to I guess illustrate why it's important to involve all the different stakeholders and, and yeah, to show setting that goal, bringing in different people in this, in this case, academics to help solve a specific problem which allows uh, more metals to be recycled uh, in a clean and non-toxic uh, way. So I think that's, that's a really key message and, and very good illustration of that. I think moving that a little bit broader, um, in terms of supporting developing nations, uh, which obviously UNEP uh, has also been focusing on, what are some of UNEP's efforts? Would you be able to describe them, uh, Mr. Stone, to provide sufficient knowledge and technology and information, as well as funds, to developing countries to help their transition also to a circular economy? It's a fascinating discussion that we're having, and I'm learning a lot, um, both from the colleagues in Korea as well as internationally. Um, from UNEP's point of view, um, our ambition is around knowledge. It's around knowledge and science. And how can we bring this knowledge in a very practical way to countries that are grappling with the transition that the Vice Minister spoke of? Um, one of the tools that we've developed is called a hotspots analysis tool. Um, you can Google it at SCP. Uh, hat, hotspotsanalysistool.org, and it has time series data on 150 countries over 25 years, looking at their carbon, water, nature, toxicity profiles in each sector of the economy. This is a very powerful planning device for those countries that want to shift away from those parts of the economy that might be creating legacy issues, risks, and liabilities. <laughs> to growth parts of the of, of the industry as well. Um, so deepening our knowledge around how we create more value um, without creating risks and liabilities. The other thing that I would say is uh, on the value chain issue, UNEP with its partners is doing a lot of work to increase understanding around the value chains and make this available. So for example, in Nigeria, we're doing a lot of work on extended producer responsibility and also electronics waste. Believe it or not, a lot of the world's electronic waste goes to Nigeria. And so how do we work with those countries to deal with the flow as it's arriving, but also deal with the countries that are producing the components in the first place? Um, so overall, it's a very big challenge. I'm very pleased to be part of this panel and with countries associated with countries like the Netherlands that are taking big leadership roles uh, in electronics, for example, and uh, Vice Minister probably knows we'll be launching um, a specific uh, initiative around ICT in the coming months. Uh, but that's our that's our program at UNEP. Get the knowledge out there, make it practical, make it accessible, and then work with countries to put it into action. Thanks, and back to you, James. Thank you very much, Stephen. That sounds really exciting, the hotspot tool. I think um, it be very useful uh, for, I guess, governments and countries, but also fascinating as individuals to go and have a look at what those legacy impacts are. Um, thank you very much for telling us about that, and thank you very much for very insightful uh, uh, discussion today. Um, um, so I think in terms of tying everything together today, which we have talked about, um, I think there are three uh, major points that have, have come through. The first is that I think we've seen that there is an economic case for moving towards a circular economy. We know that there is both consumer demand and there are also uh, significant savings to be made in terms of energy efficiency uh, and carbon reduction. The second point is that through that, there will be positive side effects. So not only are there obvious benefits in terms of reducing the amount of waste that's going to landfill, but there are positive side effects on other important environmental issues such as climate change. And I think third, perhaps the most important point is that in order to be able to achieve this circular economy, that it's important for all the different stakeholders across government, business, and citizens and NGOs, academia, to work together, to think about these problems together, and to contribute applied 
and suitable solutions to meeting these sustainability goals. So it's been a wonderful discussion. Today we've had a deep discussion on ways to promote the circular economy with experts from around the globe. We'd like to say a massive thank you to the panelists and to the audience for their participation. Great exploration and accomplishments cannot be done alone. And in order to find the right passage, it will necessitate the collective wisdom and experience of a diverse range of people and stakeholders. This also applies to finding the best route to develop the circular economy. Only when we come together and share our knowledge and wisdom can we quickly move forwards to a greener future. Sharing the knowledge from a diverse range of experts is what's made this session today so enlightening. And once again, thank you very much for allowing me to be a part of it. It's been a really great discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of our panelists and speakers who joined us through Zoom and also in-person speakers. Thank you very much for the insightful speeches and also answers. And especially, we'd like to extend our sincere gratitude to Mr. Hooper for leading the session. Thank you once again. Uh, today's session seems to have provided us uh, with a clearer and more tangible road to the circular economy. While the discussion was taking place, the work of the joint performance team has taken shape. So what would the circular economy society that we're going to make together look like? So now, the paintings will be moved up to the stage to be completed. representing the implementation of circular economy is now completed. And I believe something amazing is about to happen as you can see some names on the screen. Now, names of speakers are funneled into the picture as if all the wisdom that we had shared together today are being merged into the picture. As the black and white pictures takes on vivid color, the zero waste society that we have envisioned comes to life. 
just like the picture, we wish for the entire world to achieve circular economy through action and participation. Thank you. A road to circular economy is a journey that cannot be taken alone. From the government and the businesses to civil society and individual citizens must come together to forge a compact that will allow us to navigate the way forward. The 2021 P4G Seoul Summit Circular Economy Session. We sincerely hope that the session functioned as a meaningful platform that allowed us to share our thoughts and gave us clarity to pursue action. Now it's your turn to bring about changes towards brighter tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of the 2021 P4G Seoul Summit's Circular Economy Session. Once again, thank you very much for your participation and goodbye.